I'm Lucian Fogoros. I'm the co-founder of IoT World. I'd like to welcome the 750 plus people that uh, chose to spend the next hour with us. I'd like to introduce the moder moderator, Hamish McKenzie. Uh, Hamish, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks very much, Lucian. And we're going to be looking at some of the key aspects of the IT OT data integration topic, uh, as well as showing some of the uh, as, as showing a demo of Hitachi's uh, solution in this space. And obviously, we're going to be getting a lot of valuable insights from the uh, the speakers, um, but we also want to make sure we leave time for your questions as well. So please put your questions in the Q and A session, um, and uh, that will just make it easier for me to find them. We're also going to have a quick poll running. Uh, so it's only three questions, so please do take part in that. Um, and I'm sure most of you are aware this event is being hold, held in partnership with IIoT World. Um, and the, I just wanted to give you a heads up that there we've got the Manufacturing Day coming up on May 17th, May 18th uh, as well this year. So look out for that one. You can find all the details on the website. Um, in this session, though, we're going to be looking at the challenges uh, of industrial companies when they're trying to integrate and extract maximum value from their IT and OT data. Specifically, we're going to be looking at how to blend and curate IT and OT data across an enterprise, the biggest OT data quality issues, time series, tag descriptions, and timestamp synchronization, for example, uh, and also cross-department optimization at analytics and enablement. I'm delighted to be joined by two of Itachi Bantara's leading IT OT data integration experts on this panel. Um, first, we have Stephen Garbrecht, dire Director, Lumada Data Ops and IoT Platform at Hitachi Bantara. Stephen is a value-added and thoughtful leader who helps IT managers understand the world of operations technology and OT managers uh, get a better handle on uh, IT and the value that that brings to the world of IoT. He believes that by helping the two teams work together, they can really accomplish great things and transform the industry. Um, he's responsible for driving strategy, execution, managing and nurturing talent, delivering growth, forming strategic partnerships, and successfully implementing and overseeing complex projects. He's extremely experienced in the internet uh, of things generally and related topics. And Stephen's gonna be examining some of those challenges that I mentioned, also providing some real world customer examples of how IT and OT data integration is being leveraged in the field. Next, we have Rich Nagel, Principal Solution Architect for Hitachi Bantara, supporting the Lamada Industrial Data Ops product line. Um, Rich has 24 years of industry experience in very technical capacities throughout his career. All roles he's uh, have always been linked to connected devices, which has helped shape his career uh, in the Internet of Things. He began his career as an R&D engineer for the first seven years, and he was developing chips for the wireless industry. This led him to a role um, in mobile apps in very, very uh, different roles, and ultimately a, lot, a role as a director of mobile apps for a Fortune 500 healthcare company. For the better part of the last 12 years, Rich has worked with the leading IIoT platform companies and has been focused on helping customers mm -hmm. across all industries successfully de develop and deploy IIoT solutions. He holds an MSEE from USC and an MBA from the University of California in San Diego. And he's going to be showing us a, a demo of, uh, of how Hitachi Vantara's uh, data integration solution really works. So I'm going to hope that you're, you've all been following that. You've all been able to hear me. Um, Steve, Rich, I'm going to hand over to you um, in order to, in order for us to get started. And in the meantime, I will try and uh, fix my technical problems here. So thanks for your patience. Yep. Th thanks, Hamish. You're doing a great job. It, it went, off, went off really well. Hey, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about unlocking operational efficiency with ITOT data integration. And let's talk a little bit about you know, what this really means from a, from a customer point of view, from a, um, from a client point of view, and a company point of view. So for many years, you know, decades, in fact, uh, business operations and in industrial operations or equipment operations have optimized their parts of their organization very effectively, right? There have been systems, applications, solutions that have gone in to help those things really, really work well for the company that they, that they encompass. But we're finding we're kind of hitting a little bit of a block wall here in overall optimization, where we really need to pull together IT and OT data for a purpose. You know, taking information from your business systems and external feed sources, you know, things that are kind of operating in the um, in, in the uh, um, you know, the front office side of the business, if you will, or the corporate level, and and then marrying that with equipment information. You know, all the, the sensor information, the the operations information from the individual sites. And, and put that together for a purpose. 
you know, for greater automation across the entire business, not just automation at the plant, but automation in the business itself. Um, creating a, a visibility, a 360 degree type of a, a look at what's going on in the customer's uh, area, as well as in operations. So people are more enabled to make decisions and provide better service as part of that. A lot of companies are taking their, uh, their brick and mortar uh, operations and turning that into a digital business. In order to do that, they really need to bring together all of their expertise, all of their information, their data, to be able to deliver that to a customer as a new type of a digital product. Um, and then you get things you know, from, from an operations point of view, like a better view into the supply chain, uh, agility and understanding what's going on with customers out there so you can better serve them. And, and also be able to predict what's going on in the operations so you can produce to what is needed versus producing to schedules. So that becomes more, more effective and more cost savings and more agile in the way you run your business as part of that. And of course, risk can be abated by all, by all these things, being able to, to uh, anticipate what's gonna happen, take action on it, uh, guide people in what to do. That's what IT and OT data integration is all about. On the next slide, let's talk about an example here for a customer, right? So utilities are companies that are doing a lot of digital transformation these days, right? Um, here's an example of a customer uh, or of, of a company that we did business with that is basically managing you know, over 10 million energy customers in multiple regions around the globe. And you know, data management is a major part of what, they, what they're tasked with. And they have thousands of, of, of records that they need to manage and, and organize and make sense of. Um, a lot of that data is dark, it's coming from different organizations, it's not standardized. Um, and also it's, there's a lot of privacy issues involved because we have sensitive data, people's credit cards, uh, and their billing information, um, you know, different regulations in different, in different parts of the world about, um, about uh, privacy, for example. So they were able to put in a, uh, an ML-driven solution that we helped to provide that helped them to organize all of these different records um, across all of their energy customers. Uh, you're turning to them a savings of over $4 million as part of this and over 24% of the annual cost reduction by using these tools. In fact, there was so much data, it really made it hard for any individual to even do the job. So you know, having these kind of tools to work with data where you can organize and automatically condition it is very important. Another example, which is even more closer to the ITOT integration problems, is around um, a large uh, energy utility who did a lot of work over the last couple of decades in putting in smart meters and, uh, and setting up the digitization of their customers so they could really understand more efficiently what was going on at their individual locations. They wanted to take that information and combine it with their business data so they could have their, their service people provide better capabilities to their customers and better solve their problems. So the, the call center people could immediately see what was going on from a situational awareness point of view and combine together the data from GIS systems, from weather, from demographics to not only you know, provide information to them and solve their problems in the instant, but also to do longer term planning and even to create uh, more revenue opportunities to understand you know, the usage of people out there in, in their uh, markets and, and match that to products that they offer or are developing for their customers to provide better capabilities for them. So really reducing that, that time to insights and providing better visibility and more agility as a company and better customer satisfaction overall for them. If we go to the next slide, let's talk a little bit about ITOT in different industries. We know industrial, where we got things like oil and gas companies, where if you, if you have damage in the field, you could you know, take your, your data from the actual operation systems and marry that with spare parts information and provide ability for somebody to have all the parts more quickly to solve a problem for a customer when they go out there in the, in the, in the field. Transportation systems is always that balance of, of managing uh, the planning of inspections and work with the schedules of a uh, transportation system, like a train system, for example, or a bus system, to make sure you're providing a high level of quality for your customers from a service level point of view. Construction equipment is being digitized more in construction companies where they want to automatically bill. Uh, if you have a rental company, being able to bill the equipment more easily uh, for the usage of your customer to track that equipment. Uh, ITOT data integration helps with that. 
in the medical industries, you know, being able to monitor remotely patient status and even schedule automatically in the systems for them to come in for a follow-up based upon what's going on uh, diagnostically in the field with them. And then of course, energy customers that we talked about. But it doesn't stop there. Commercial uh, ITOT integration activities can also happen, right? So banks, you think of a banking customer where now that they can, uh, they have security systems, they can, they can start to understand the person that walks into their bank, you know, what is their status with them? Maybe they, they're, they have millions of dollars with that bank. Maybe they should get a little, little bit level, uh, higher level of customer experience as part of that so they can respond as part of that. Uh, retail organizations are under pressure right now from an inventory point of view. So they can use IT and OT data integration to monitor the movements of people in the stores, better adjust their inventory and be more profitable as part of that and even be viable in this economy. Uh, telecom customers, uh, they, they can go out there and they can look at the performance of, of assets and then manage the service activities around that more effectively to provide a higher level of, of delivery and uptime. Um, insurance companies are doing a lot more digitization where they're providing products to their customers to monitor the systems and the facilities that they have uh, under their ins insurance contracts to help provide a better level of service for them, but also to have them maintain themselves so they, they can uh, um, you know, reduce risk for the different, uh, different uh, services they provide as part of that. Military and law, law enforcement is always an idea of understanding what your asset conditions are and the maintenance activities around those when you go to deploy things. So you can quickly make decisions on what to do, what to, what to provide in an emergency, for example. And then finally, data centers. You know, there's a big requirement for data centers to provide more carbon neutral solution capabilities. Um, so being able to monitor all of their facilities activities, their, their cooling, along with their computing, and marrying all that IT and OT data together to provide a reduction in their greenhouse uh, gas emissions, but also provide a higher level of service to people as part of that and cost savings. So, the, so IT, OT integration is very important in many industries. On the next slide, I'll, I'll leave you with this. We did a survey recently in one of our other webinars where we asked customers and, and people who attended the, uh, the webinar what are some of the key challenges that you have in IT, OT data integration? And two things that they called out were the ability for, um, uh, to um, uh, look at the descriptions of the timestamps uh, or, the, or the tags that are coming from individual operation systems, could be PLCs, historians, and rationalizing that, making it more known for everybody in the, in the company. So they now know that that cryptic uh, tag name that might be from a particular site is really a heater heater uh, value, for example. And they can use that in their analytics and in their reporting more thoroughly and marry it with, I, with, OT, with IT data in the system more effectively. But then also synchronizing timestamps. You know, you have all these different systems that have uh, different clocks. They may have different uh, time references that they're using to pull that together and put it in context. So now you can marry work order information, for example, with the equipment status as part of that, or any, any other kind of a system that has time related data associated with it. And they all agreed that they wanted to pull together these cross departmental or optimization analytics that could serve the company more effectively. If they can give their, their order people more information of the status of what's going on in production or systems that are online, if they're providing a service like, a, like elect electricity, for example, but then also the people at the individual plants and the and remote operations, so they can understand what's going on with their parts that they've ordered, with the customer orders that they have to deliver and synchronize that information more effectively. They want to do that. So I'll, I'll leave you with this and I'll turn it over to Rich for a discussion of how we could uh, approach this problem. Sure, thanks, Steve. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. All right, next slide, please. And the next one. And so, like Steve said, it was, it was good high-level overview of how uh, these issues that data management can help uh, resolve uh, with IT and OT data and those last two aspects about timestamp data and as well as uh, uh, being able to make the data more discoverable. Um, are what I'm hoping to be able to speak a little bit more for on on these next couple slides and then get into the demo. Um, and so one of the things that's gotten a lot of buzz out in the, uh, the industrial space is that of a unified namespace. Uh, and many of you might be familiar with this. If you're not, just a really quick high level 
uh, overview where you have on your left your traditional point-to-point -point integration where you would have your, your sensors connected to the SCADA solutions uh, and then the MES and ERP solutions up to the cloud. And each one of those connections really takes an integration. And so anytime you needed to add more sensors uh, uh, to, um, uh, to your shop floor, it would require additional integration. And that's very inefficient. Um, and so, you know, what's come up in recent years is more discussion about a unified namespace. And there's different ways to accomplish that. But basically, at a high level, um, what it does, it turns it on its side, uh, where you, you have an event broker. Um, as well as a, a well-defined topic namespace where you'll have uh, structures where um, looks like there's a poll up right now. And I'll, actually, I'll pause for the poll right now, if that's okay. Yeah, exactly. So this is the first poll question, and it's it's relevant specifically to this slide. Um, are you using a unified namespace solution today? Yes, not yet. We're interested. No or don't know. So it'd be great if you could, uh, everyone here could... Uh, could give us your answer on that. And as you're filling that out, I'll continue on. Um, and, and so basically, there's a defined topic structure where any application could be able to identify where that sensor is or where whatever component that's connected to that unified namespace might be. And there's also a defined structure of any downstream application would, would know what that structure is. And so not only could it find the necessary data, it could also decompose that structure and get at the data uh, that's needed. And so it really alleviates the, the integration that's needed uh, by by having this unified namespace in place. Um, <clears throat> and I'll, I've got a couple of demonstrations about how you can go and accomplish this. Um, whoops, there we go. There's the results from the, <laughs> from the survey. Yeah, so as you, we can see, only 11% uh, are already using a unified namespace at the moment, um, but there is quite a significant portion uh, exploring it. Um, and But almost half of people here at least are, are not using one yet. Yeah, interesting results. And I, I guess I would expect that because it's relatively uh, new. Um, if we go to the, the next slide, you know, the unified namespace will help you uh, find data in, in real time and make it discoverable across your organization so that can feed uh, machine learning algorithms and, and uh, really represent a digital twin of your organization. Um, but you also need to have the need to, to have historical data. Uh, and this is where data management tools can help as well, too. Uh, you typically would have, a, you know, an environment where you just have data scattered all over the place, your data silos or your puddles of uh, dark and OT data. Uh, and really um, what's needed is to be able to, to take that data and store it into a data lake, a, a source of trust where you can find that data and it's addressable. And we do that with uh, the Pentaho data integration tool that I'll give you a demonstration of, as well as our data catalog uh, capabilities, which would give uh, basically a, a, a naming and identification of uh, what those, those that data is in business terms, as well as to make it discoverable. Uh, and searchable so that the data analysts and scientists can be able to discover that data. And so your traditional uh, you know, architecture would from the left would, would then be uh, put into something that's in the right where you can have all your data being discoverable uh, and able to, to be used for your analytics purposes. Next slide, please. Um, if you click on it one more, it'll expose some underlying, uh, there we go, perfect. And so what is Pentaho Data Integration? This is the integration tool that we're going to use to be able to show you how you can accomplish uh, the, the aforementioned. Um, and so Pentaho has been around for since the early 2000s. So it started out as an ETL tool, a data integration tool. It's evolved over time as uh, data needs have evolved. Um, and so if you look at the bottom layer there, this is traditionally how IT organizations would uh, ingest your data and, and manage your data for analytics purposes. You would have the ability to, to read all different types of traditional data files, your Excels, your CSVs, uh, hook up to your ERP systems and grab that data and ingest it and then store it into a, a data warehouse. Uh, that data warehouse would be the source of truth. And then you could use your ETL tool again to be able to serve that up into data marts. And this would be able to more efficiently allow those, uh, those business intelligence engines to be able to grab that data and display it for visual purposes or analytics purposes or whatever your needs might be. And so that's been around for a while. And around 2010 or so, uh, you know, big data in Hadoop and, and, and uh, technologies like that started to come out. And we needed to adapt to that, to this high speed, high data rate uh, uh, type of ingest. And so Pentaho adapted to that. 
Uh, you see on the left-hand side the different types of modern data sources that might be out there. Uh, and Pentaho can connect to those through streaming services, through REST APIs, uh, and, and through other uh, big data adapters that we have. Um, and in this use case, we're going to adapt to uh, streaming services, so MQTT or Kafka, um, and be able to ingest that data in. That would typically be your OT data that's coming from your shop floor. Uh, and then you, for what your, whatever your analytic purposes might be, you might want to be able to combine that with IT data. And we've got an example of that of a, a welder company where we've got some uh, information coming in from welds and they're having quality issues and they want to be able to combine that data along with the experience of the welders that are there to be able to feed an AI uh, a machine learning algorithm and, and give up the results. And so Pintao is a very useful tool to be able to connect to various different types of data sources uh, to be able to blend that data, that IT and OT data, and then serve it up. Uh, it does this in a number of different ways. You can have a virtual table in the middle there where you see the, uh, the uh, ETL clean and rich blend. Uh, you can take that data from the sources where it's at and have this virtual connection to feed your machine learning algorithms. Uh, but another way, a more modern way, is we're talking about that unified namespace. We can take that data and put it in the topic structure in the right format and publish that uh, to an event broker uh, so that it can be discoverable across the, the organization. And that's what I'm hoping to show um, in the demonstration. Next slide, please. And here's a high level overview of the, the demo that we'll do. Uh, you're left on your, your uh, OT systems. We have uh, different types of sources that need to be uh, uh, communicated with. You might have OPC UA connectivity from uh, uh, your devices or uh, machines that are in your shop floor. Of course, you can read data from a historian as well too and Pentaho connect to that through uh, either APIs or a JDBC connection. Uh, in many cases. And there's also MQTT, the streaming interface where uh, the data can come in. Pentaho can be containerized, so it can sit there. Typically, we'll sit on the edge uh, and be able to ingest that data um, on the floor. Uh, they can also be consumers, there are producers there, but they can also be consumers uh, there on, on the edge as well uh, to be able in, to take that data from the event broker. Uh, you see the MQTT there, the event broker, uh, and then Pentaho can sit on the other side of that to interface with the business systems. And so uh, the business systems have various different ways to connect, whether it be the standard cloud connectors that we might, uh, that we do have, um, or you know, Kafka or MQTT might be uh, a way that businesses use to be able to uh, communicate data, as well as standard systems for ticketing and maintenance and whatnot. And Pentaho can connect to those and then publish that data as well to an event broker. And additionally, it can store all this data into a data lake. And so we talked about the, the first slide to be able to, to accomplish that unified namespace. Uh, we'll show that. And then also the ability to store that data for historical purposes is where Pentaho can have it there. And that's what we'll accomplish in the in the demo. If you go to the next slide, please. OK. Um, just, just as we do that, we're going to have the second survey question, which is uh, how, per how pervasive is MQTT in the data integration solutions you have been involved with? So is it less than 25%, more than 50%, almost all today? Or don't you know? So if you could just take a minute to, to complete that while, while Rich gets his uh, demo started, that'd be great. Thank you. OK, I'm going to share my screen. Go ahead, Rich. Okay. All right. Can you see my screen? Okay. Yep. Okay. Good. Yep. And do we want to cover the results of the? Uh, there yeah. We go. So just just very quickly. So less than twenty five percent. That was around a third of people said that. More than fifty percent. Uh, about a quarter. Not very many people saying almost all. Just seven percent. And quite a lot of people don't know. I'm not sure if that's also what you expected, Rich. Um, well, it depends on the audience. We'll have to see. <laughs> we thought more would 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 not be in the unknown, but um, and I thought more would be utilizing it. But uh, this is uh, I think it's a it's a good representation. Um, and so let's uh let's look at what I've got here. This is Pentaho. This is the Spoon tool. And so what what we have here is uh the design interface that you would use to create transformations. Um, and so it's a it's a very uh, easy to use and intuitive tool. Um, I'll take you to the home page here. Uh, basically, there's a number of different files. These are the transformations that I'll go through uh, that will take the data. It will really it, it, what it does is connects to various different sources, like we mentioned. It will do something with that data to extract that data, transform it, analyze it, whatever it might be, and then it will put it somewhere, maybe in a database or maybe off to another uh, MQTT 
uh, topic or whatever that might be. And so uh, you'll see this repeating pattern that uh, will these transformations that we'll do. Um, Pentano's, like I said, been around for a long time, so 20 years or so. And so the documentation is very rich. Uh, we've got a number of different tutorials and it's also extendable. And so if there's something that it doesn't do, a lot of the, uh, the user community out there will develop uh, plugins for their specific task uh, and they'll publish that on the marketplace. Uh, many of them are free uh, and you can go and, and get those uh, uh, plugins and then add it in uh, to be able to accomplish uh, what you might want to be able to do. Um, if I want to just create a basic transformation, uh, I would just go here and, and create this transformation. Um, and you'll see a number of different steps here. Here's the design uh, area where I've got the ability to create uh, steps for inputs, outputs, uh, streaming inputs. We'll go over this more. Uh, the MQTT consumer and producer will spend a lot of time with that, but also Kafka, the ability to read OPC UA, uh, a lot of transformation capabilities to be able to manipulate the data however you, you need to. Uh, utilities to be able to, to run uh, null checks or uh, whatever that might be needed for your data. And I won't go through all of these, uh, but there's also some interesting ones for statistics, as well as uh, if you ever need to do this as a low code environment, which most of the time you don't have to, but if you needed to, a lot of customers have Python that exists and you can incorporate that into your transformations as well. Uh, that's also helping helpful for machine learning uh, purposes as well too. And so if I want to create a basic transformation, let's say I've got some data in a CSV, I would just take this CSV file input and I would double click on this and I would browse for the file that I have. And so for uh, this demo, I've got some data on welders and I'll just go to my desktop here where I've got that data and I'll bring it in. There's my desktop and then our IoT world session here. And I've got some ship data here. And so I'll bring this in. Uh, it's comma delimited, uh, and that should be enough to be able to get the fields in. So I'm going to look, and this is going to look at the fields in this uh, CSV that I have, and it brings it in. It'll say if it's string or integer, uh, and then I can also preview that data as well, too, and see what kind of data I'm up against here. Okay, so this is the data that I have that's in this CSV. Uh, and, and really, I've got different shifts here from people that are working on the, the, the welding um, operation. Uh, and the dates that they started, uh, I've got some information about them. I want to know their employee ID, and I want to understand their experience, the number of jobs, and they also have different qualifications and certificates too. And maybe those are getting dated. So maybe for my machine learning algorithm, I want to look at that. And so this all looks good. I've got that data in, uh, and I'll click OK. And then maybe I want to do something like um, take some statistics. And so I can take my univariate statistics step. And maybe I want to look at the number of jobs that they have. And so I can just pull that in from the different fields that I have. Here I've got number of jobs, uh, and I want to do a count. I can just hit true for all of these. Um, I want to check the mean, what the average is, and then maybe the standard deviation as well. And so this step is really handy just to be able to do uh, some statistical uh, analysis on the data that's coming in. What's nice too is all these steps have uh, a help button. And so you can just click on that and be able to understand uh, what these, uh, what, how the, the steps different work. It's, it's really well documented and you've got examples there uh, to be able to go through and implement uh, uh, steps as needed. And so that looks good. If I save this, I'll just save this as transformation one. Uh, and I run this, I'll be able to see this data come up. Uh, and so that was pretty quick. There wasn't a lot of data there. I can look at my steps here to see there was only 60 files, uh, lines in that. It'll execute this row by row. Um, and then it will produce the desired output. If I look at the preview the data there, it's just one row. It took the, the number of jobs, which was 60. It has the uh, average there and then the standard deviation there as well, too. And so just a very basic example of uh, how you would create a transformation. Of course, I could take this data and then put it into a, a database if I wanted to. Uh, and Pentaho would, would handle the, uh, the, the SQL and the creation of that database and, and sending the data in. So hopefully that gives you an idea of uh, how to, to develop transformations. And I've got some developed already uh, for the topics that Steve was mentioning earlier. And so the first one is um, just with time series data. And so it can be a challenge sometimes to be able to align uh, the data with the data timestamps, uh, the data that's coming in, you might need to interpolate. Uh, because there might be some no, uh, null values and, and things of that nature. And so that's what this transformation is doing. And what I've got here, I've got two CSV files. Um, 
And so uh, these are, are, are similar files. They've got uh, Unix time uh, as a timestamp that comes in from the field, and then our voltage, amperage, wire speed, and gas flow from the, the welders that are there. If I want to preview this data, I can look at this, and you'll see that um, I've got this unfriendly Unix time timestamp that's there uh, that I can convert into a more readable time. But the problem here that we have is that um, these two data sets that I have here, if I preview this data, you'll see that same data down here. Uh, this is at uh, 37565, and if I look at my data here, I've got 37815, and so there's an offset, and I want to be able to adjust to that. Um, if I wanted to, I can make this data more readable too, and so what the select value step will allow you to do is to be able to look at this data uh, and then convert it to a date, and so that's what I'm doing. I've got my data that's coming in here, and I'm changing the, the metadata aspects of this where I'm, I'm changing the, the actual type of this uh, integer into a day type and setting the format there. And so it's a lot more readable uh, uh, here and that I can see uh, that date and, and, the, and the offset there. Um, and so what I want to do with this is adjust the time. And I've got my calculator step. Um, and again, there's just a wealth of different functions that you can do with the calculator step that's here. Uh, I've got the ability to just uh, do all different types of adds and square roots and conversions of data. Uh, based on what my needs uh, might be. In this case, it's just adding a simple offset. And so I've got an offset that's 250 milliseconds off, and I'm taking, uh, creating a new field and adding that Unix time that's in this file uh, from the field uh, to that offset, and I'm creating a new uh, Unix time adjusted with that, that value there. And it's as simple as just creating and, and grabbing whatever that uh, 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 algorithm might be to solve your problem. And so that's uh, reading the data in and, and doing the adjustment. And then I want to remove some values from this, um, uh, which are the offset and the Unix time that I, I don't need anymore. Um, and then what I can do is I can filter the rows. And so uh, there might be some null values coming in there. And if I do have null values, I want to be able to remove those and be alerted on that. And so if, I, if that is the case, this will go down to the uh, where I have to adjust and interpolate. And you can have an algorithm to be able to do that there. Uh, and then route that data back into uh, the stream. But if it's good and there are no null no values, I'll just pass it off to a number range. And then this number range is another step. This is a, uh, a step that will look at the voltage uh, and it will output a field called quality. And so it will look at um, the, the range there. If I want my voltage between 120 and 130. If it is, it's good and I can tag that. So it's a, just a higher level of adding a quality metric to the data that might be there to be able to uh, just add some more checks. And this is one example of a check that you can do to make sure that that data is in range as well if it's not null. And if it, if it is, uh, then you wouldn't have to do anything and you can pass that on uh, to the end. And so if I run this, this will take the data and I can see that the, the two values here, like I said, were, were different uh, at, from 815 to 565. And then when I get to this data to be adjusted, I can see that all the way at the end, I've got my data that's, that's also tagged. I forgot to mention that uh, adding context to data was one of the things that Steve brought up. Um, and, and with Pentaho, you can add more uh, constants. And so this data is coming in, you know, it's just a CSV and no one knows where it comes from. But before you put this off to analyze or a database, it would be good to tag this with the location. This one's in Greenville and it's also station number 10, whereas the other one is in uh, Jefferson City, Missouri, and it's, it's station number 11. So there I've got my two different data sources that are tagged. They added more context. I've done some, some adjustments with the time series data. I could do interpolation if I wanted to uh, based on the data that's there, um, check for null values, and also check for um, the, the quality of the data. And the end result, this is what we have with our, uh, our timestamps being aligned uh, so that we can properly do the... Uh, the analysis on our data. And so that's it for the, the time series data. Um, next, we want to talk about the uh, unified namespace. And so what I've got here is um, Pintao is very useful to create data. And this is a, a, a uh, a, a really a data generator that I have to create the voltage, the amperage, the gas flow, and the wire speed. And it's kind of produced this on a MQT producer step that I have off to the local host. I got a local broker running here and it's gonna go on this uh, topic called demo topic is where this is gonna reside. And so if I run this, we'll start to see our demo, uh, our, our data that's being generated. 
If you remember from that slide that I have, you can get data from OPCOA, uh, maybe from a JDBC connection or read that data from a historian. In this case, it's just existing on NQTT, so I'm just converting that uh, data that, that, that's there. And so if I look at my demo topic, I'm connected here to my local host, and I subscribe to this, I should be able to see my data that's coming in uh, from uh, the, the output. I could also preview it here. And so here's the data where I've got my voltage, uh, some other data that I'm not concerned with, the amperage, wire speed, and gas flow. And so you might want to take all that data that's coming from this device and put it out there. And you certainly can do that. In our example, we're just going to take those four values and show you how, um, how that, can, that can work. And so this is the the Unified Namespace uh, Operational Data Converter. Um, this is what we'll do it. And basically what we're doing is we're grabbing this data in from this MQTT consumer. Uh, we're gonna be able to take the data that's in one row and put it in their own separate rows so that they can be published out on the topic that they want. Uh, and that's what this is accomplishing. So if I, if I run this, this will, um, in fact, let me talk about this step here for a second. Uh, this will also connect to localhost, and this will connect to that demo topic, and so it will read the data in that's coming in here. And so I'll hit OK, and I'll run this. And so every time that data gets produced, it will be put on the topic, and then this consumer uh, will be able to read that data and bring it in, and it will execute this transformation every single time it gets some data on that. And that's what you see with this log happening here. And if I preview the data, I can see that you know every second or so, I've got a new stream of uh, data that, that comes in that I need to process. And so this is what I'm looking at. I've got some JSON data with a timestamp there. Um, and I wanna be able to read that JSON data in. And that's what this JSON input step does. And so it will allow you to uh, connect to um, the, the, the message, the streaming data message that's coming in and look at the fields that are there. So it'll separate that data into fields. Uh, you can have a hierarchical mo JSON model and it can, it can parse that. Uh, as well. And it's really pretty easy to do. You just click select fields and we'll be able to populate that information for you. So I've got my individual fields in and then I want to select the values. And so this is what uh, it looks like outside of the JSON. Now I've got just standard columns where I've got my voltage, my amperage, and my wire speed, and my gas flow. And so the, the problem is, is that this is all in one row. And I want to be able to put this on their own separate rows uh, to be able to publish these accordingly because that's how Pintaho works. It works on a row by row level. And so what I'm going to do is turn this uh, row format or columnar format into rows. And that's what you see here. And so for each individual timestamp, you'll have the four separate values with the data. And those are being set out individually with each row to be able to be published on the, on the consumer. I'm sorry, on the producer. And so I'll rename these values um, and then I'll put this into a JSON output. And that's what you see here, this, this output that's the amperage, its value and a timestamp, the voltage, its value and a timestamp. Uh, and so now I've got this into the structure uh, that I want. Uh, you can add more structure if needed to. This is just a simple example, but for uh, to be uh, uh, for uh, um, applying to the, the the structure that you need for the scheme that you want, uh, Pentaho can certainly add to that as well too. And we're going to do a stream lookup, and the stream lookup will simply look at the name of uh, the field that's there, if it's amperage or voltage, and it will look up the the data that's inside of this. Uh, uh, grid that I have here. And this is our namespace. And so you typically populate this with a lot of different uh, data, but basically I've got my amperage here. And then the topic I want to put it on is this namespace here where I've got uh, a uh, version of the namespace and the a, a group that it's in, and then the type of message that's there. But really what's, what's important is this unified way. I, I know it's at station 12. I know it's device one. And then uh, the, the amperage data is what I want. And the same with voltage wire and gas flow. And so if I look uh, at the producer here, I can preview the data and see that all this data is going out on its own separate namespace for amperage. It's going off on the amperage namespace and the voltage is going off in voltage. And I can see that here also too, if I've got my topic that I wanna subscribe to, I'll unsubscribe to this and I'll subscribe to my amperage here. And subscribe, and then there's the data that are co coming in. I can see that on this amperage topic, I just have my amperage data with the timestamp and the value that's there for the downstream applications. And so that's just a simple example of how you can accomplish it, but it's fairly straightforward and easy. Hopefully I, I explained that well enough where you just get your, your data in and then you uh, reformat it into the way that's needed 
uh, and then apply the, the topic namespace and send it off to a producer on the topic uh, that, that's uh, required for that. Um, in the same way with OT data, we can do the same thing with IT data. And so that uh, original um, uh, spreadsheet that I had, and this is in a table input because it's in a, in a table, um, I put that into a, a table and, and really what I wanna do is just query the last day's data here. And so this is our, our table input. Um, again, an easy step to use. Uh, I, you can connect to various different types of databases that are here. It's easy to configure. I've got my shift data and I've got a Postgres database that's running here locally, my authentication. Um, and it's, uh, you just cho choose the one that you, uh, database that you need, and then you can connect to that. And so I've got my uh, data here and I wanna get from yesterday's data. And so that's what this query is doing. Um, and so I'll bring that data in. In fact, if I, if I show you this, in fact, it's right here from the preview data step. Uh, it's reading in this data. So I've got my employee ID, uh, their certification dates, their name, also the number of jobs that they have. And again, I wanna be able to look at this data from the, the experience that they have and combine that with the, the OT data to understand the quality errors that might be having. Maybe their experience level is affecting the, the quality of uh, the wells that are happening. So the next steps, I wanna filter these rows. I, I wanna be able to look at the data that's on the, on the last shift. Um, and what's nice about this is you can put variables into the transformation so they can be dynamic. And so in this properties section that I have here, I've got a parameter called current shift and I can change this to shift one, shift two, shift three. They, they change out every uh, three hours. So I wanna grab the latest shift information, which is currently shift one, um, and, then, and, and then select those values that are needed. I really don't want all of that information. I just want the number, uh, the employee ID, uh, the shift that they're on, the date, uh, and then uh, when that started, and then their experience as well too. And so that's the information that I'm getting. And I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna separate this into uh, uh, these uh, individual one row into four different rows and then publish this out. And so I'm just uh, going through the same process here where I'm putting the data together uh, for the employee ID, its value, and then the, the jobs, their value, and publishing that in a namespace. And here's the namespace again, where I've got the different values that are here. Um, and then uh, I'm doing a lookup again in the same manner uh, to be able to put this data out on the right topic. And if I go to the MP producer and preview that data, let me run this. This will run once because I'm just reading this table once. This isn't hooked up to an MQTT connection where it's executing every time. This is just being executed once every eight hours to take that data and then publish it out there. And then there's the data that I have on the different topics uh, that are there. And so that uh, put the data out there. And you might be asking, well, how do I get this to run once every eight hours? That's um, with the user console. And so um, Pintao, it, uh, that was this, the spoon tool that we used to create the transformations. And now you need to, to manage those transformations. Um, and this is how you do that as well as uh, some with some business intelligence uh, the tools that you can you can have to to visualize the data. But really what I want to do is I want to be able to browse my files and then that data that I had was in this uh, the transformation I had was saved here into this converter and I want to schedule this. And so to schedule this, um, I can uh, select this. There's no output for this. So I don't need to, to put that anywhere. But I want to run this uh, on an hourly basis and I want to run this every eight hours um, and then, I uh, uh, have that occur for the rest of time. Um, and then I can put the current shift in there and I'll have to update the current shift, but you can pass variables to this uh, that will execute uh, every single time. And so now my schedule is created and I can see it here. And then I can also execute this here or adjust as needed for my, my scheduling. And so that's um, how the, the spoon, the transformation tool, you, you develop um, the transformations as needed. Uh, you save them, and then you're able to manage and execute them in this uh, user console interface that we have here. Um, and some of the things you might want to do too is create different reports. We've got reporting capabilities uh, uh, to be able to look at pivot table type of reports. You can put that data into cubes uh, and look at dimensions to be able to uh, slice and dice the data. There's also the ability to put data into uh, pixel perfect reports um, as needed, where you can set up these reports as variables and, and add the data in as well as uh, dashboards and, and things of those capabilities to be able to uh, visualize the data in that manner. 
Um, and so that's really what I had for you guys. Um, the, you've got the ability to, to, to manage that time series data. And we've also shown the ability to take that OT data and the IT data and, uh, and put it into a, a unified namespace. Um, and then also, um, as far as a, a data lake might go, to be able to put data into um, the data lake, Pitaho connects the various different types of uh, databases um, and something that would show you how to do that would be something like this, um, where I can take my data in from an FTT con consumer and I can extract those JSON fields and format the data as needed. And then I can put it into uh, really any type of format that I want and store that into a, a database that, that, that would take it. So maybe it's an S3 store uh, that I can put that in or maybe a MongoDB. Uh, and here's your traditional type of uh, uh, data outputs that you would have uh, to be able to, to place the data in the format that, that's required, as well as uh, the database that would be um, the complementary to those types of different formats. And with that, I'll stop sharing and happy to take any questions. Now, oh, here we go. Here's another poll. Great. Thank you very much, Rich. Yeah, so this is the last question. Um, so how many, what, what do people think in terms of um, the usefulness of Pentaho for their next ITOT data integration project? Please, uh, you know, give us your opinion on that one as well. Uh, while you're doing that, we'll also get into some questions. We have had a few. Uh, there's one which, which Steve already um, answered to in, in the chat, but I'm not sure if everyone can, can see that uh, answer. So I'm going to ask the question anyway. Uh, and I apologize, apologize in advance for my probably appalling pronunciation of, the, of some of the names here. So this is a question from Vladimir Nedashkovsky. Um, he says, when building an industrial data lake, how would you address the issue of having data, having to collect data from multiple geographical areas? Um, for consolidation purposes, because many countries, uh, you know, have a policy of preventing OT from crossing borders. Uh, so, Steve, could you talk to that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a great question. Um, so, so you know, over time, uh, things have kind of evolved in how data is managed around an enterprise and across across multiple enterprises too. <clears throat> you know, started off with uh, just integrating the data and putting it in a data warehouse or in a data lake itself from a storage point of view. And there you're actually transferring the data to another location. It could be in the cloud, it could be in a data center, and you know, you're, you're managing it that way. Um, a more modern approach to it and a data ops focused approach has been to let the data stay where it's at, especially if it's got a um, requirements for GDPR or, or personal information, or maybe, um, you know, whatever you know, regulations might be uh, involved with it. Or maybe, you know, you don't want to put all your data in the cloud because of the cost constraints that you have, and you want to optimize how your, how your cloud spend is for data storage. You can let the data sit where it's at, and using a data catalog like what we have, you can reference that data remotely. And for all extensive purposes, from the user point of view, they have access to the data as if it was in one repository. But in reality, it's sitting in multiple repositories, and you can just call it through the API or through the data catalog interface. So a data catalog is a really useful um, product to be able to, to manage your data no matter where it's at. And we call that kind of a, a data fabric, if you will. That's a new, new term that comes out where your fabric of your data is located everywhere. Um, it's not just one particular repository that you're managing. OK, great. And so we have another question, which is very relevant to, to, to that answer as well, I think, uh, which is um, from Yao Schultz Zeng. As data from different sources gets put into the data lake, as you've just been describing, um, surely there's a danger that unauthorized people might be able to access it. So how do you secure uh, the data within the data lake? Rich, you want to take that? Yeah, uh, there's different ways of doing that. Uh, um, <laughs> Essentially, with a roles-based access scheme and, and making sure that uh, the only the appropriate users have have access, and that's typically you know connected to an LDAP or uh, the, the LDAP type of system, um, and then uh, identifying the data as sensitive with the data catalog uh, to make sure that um, the data is known uh, and, and and this level of sensitivity uh, associated with that data is known. Um, and, and shared and, and only shared with people with the, the need to know access there. I don't know if you have any more to add to that, Steve, but that's essentially the basics yeah. of how it's done. Only, only an example from a customer. For example, we worked with customers who had you know, millions of records 
uh, inside of their, their data lake or their multiple data databases that they're using in their company. And they were really sure that there was no proprietary or uh, confidential information in those records. You know, they, they applied our data catalog, which is able to search all of that data. And it came back with, these are the files that contain sensitive information. So now they could go ahead and tag those as, as sensitive and, and further re reduce the need for uh, exposure to fines and, and uh, um, you know, uh, problems from, from uh, audits that they would have as part of that. So those are some advanced tools you can use to also ensure that, that your data is in compliance. Okay, great. Um, another question from, uh, at least I think this is what Adriano Costa is is asking. Please correct me, Adriano, if I'm not getting this right. But I think what he's asking is, um, Pentaho, is Pentaho data integration and Spoon, are they only, uh, you know, commercial products or, or is there a way to, aspect, to, to access them from a you know, community perspective or a trial perspective? Go ahead, go ahead Rich. Sure. Yeah, no, we have a we, we, it's open source. We've got a community version that's available um, and it's 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 really uh, it's it's feature rich in what it does. And we've got tens of thousands of users that use that uh, once they get to the level where they want some more complexity. Uh, there's additional features that are available in our enterprise edition, as well as a very uh, robust support that's offered with that. And so often we'll get uh, customers that have used Pentaho for years and they, they, they need the additional functionality or support and they'll turn to us to be able to uh, uh, help them with uh, the, the additional needs they have. And so there's both versions that are available, uh, just a difference with support and additional functionality. Yep. Okay, yeah. great. Just, so just to, add, just to add to that, we, uh, we have a lot of students and uh, people who use the community edition, the uh, open source version for uh, you know, individual projects. And also it's a great way to trial the product. Um, you know, typically when you're running an enterprise on it, you want to make sure you have a, a high level of, of uh, you know, call support and also additional features from a monitoring and a capability point of view. So we kind of bake those into the enterprise edition that you pay, pay for, basically. But, um, you know, our customers get a lot of, lot of value for, for the license fees that are charged for it and the capabilities it provides uh, kind of as a Swiss army knife uh, of, of sorts for anything you need to do for data management. Perfect. Okay, great. So yeah, we've got, we've got a few more questions coming in now. Um, so from Cesar Swide, in connection to ITOT, you said that this could be used also uh, in utility companies. Uh, and he's very interested because he works with utility companies. And he always thought that I, this whole two ITOT issue was really, really only um, talked about in relation to the manufacturing company. So could you just talk maybe a little bit about the utility side? Yeah, absolutely. We work with Hitachi Energy uh, a lot, too, because all of their opportunities require integration in one shape or form. Um, maybe it's taking data from assets and feeding an APM tool, or maybe it's integrating with a REST API to help with demand forecasting. Uh, so there's all those different types of things Pentaho is capable of doing, and it really helps um, to, uh, to give a, a full offering to our, our, our customers to be able to help those utilities with their data management needs. Uh, additionally, there's other use cases that we have for uh, um, <clears throat> customer 360s. And so to look at the customer consumption, their bills, um, and really just a holistic view of how the utility is, is uh, performing with respect to the customers that Pentaho is used for, for 360s as well. And so those, uh, just a couple examples of how Pentaho is used with utilities. Okay, great. And Cesar says it would be interested in, in hearing some more about a few examples. So um, maybe we can arrange that um, after the session to, 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 to make some uh, examples available about that. Perfect. Okay, uh, now we have Ahmed Saka. Can we integrate the data in real time, like with Socket IO and those kind of, uh, those kind of things? Yeah, good question. Um, you know, I'm not sure how to interface with Socket IO, but if it has a REST API, we can certainly integrate with that. Uh, of course, that depends on your de definition of <laughs> real time, what the latency requirements are there. Um, that would be the concern. But you know, Pitao is highly performant. It's really it, it scales extremely well. It's used for you know big data in, in the financial institutions and processing that data. So typically, Pentaho is not the bottleneck. Uh, for speed, as long as you put the enough compute and memory underneath it, uh, it can certainly scale well. Uh, but uh, we'd have to understand those real-time requirements and, and how to interface with Socket IO uh, uh, to better answer that question. Okay, great. Um, I have another question here from Rahul 
Saha, who says, does it also help to integrate for control purposes? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> you know, I think the, the control systems do well what they what they do, depending on the crit criticality of that. But, um, you know, that's that's on a one-by-one uh, -one basis, I think, that you'd want to make sure that uh, uh, what you're implementing doesn't cause any more damage than harm, potentially, uh, to do that. But you can certainly publish uh, data and have that consumed uh, by a control system if that is something that uh, would meet your needs. I think there's a lot of debate out there about uh, uh, how uh, the, how safe that is to do. So it, it depends on the on this example. Yeah, I mean for optimization, where you're pulling data from multiple systems and you're combining you know the the control system data with other data and coming up with a uh, you know a, a, an approximation of what you want to do from a set point point of view. Uh, you know, maybe you went, got some economic indicators that you want to take into account, uh, scheduling other things that are outside of the control system, and you, you're manipulating that up in the, either the cloud or you know in a data center or, or a computer where you're you're calculating an optimization scheme, and then you want to take that information and send it back down to the control system as a set point. Certainly, you know, as long as you're, you know, typically you wouldn't use it for regulatory control or or for supervisory control right that's really critical it's really more of a, like for optimization typically what we're talking about here okay so i just want to we've got two more just see if we can squeeze these in very quickly i think they should be fairly uh quick so are there any from ashay sued are there any examples um from pharma manufacturing where data is very heavily regulated For process control and whatnot, you know, Steve, is our link or, or, or just in, just in general for the pharma industry? Rich. Yeah, just yeah. general, I think. Yeah. 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 Anything uh, in, in pharma. Yeah. I'm trying to think of specific examples with the Tachi. I, I just, you know, I've been here for a, a year and a half, and I don't have specific examples personally with it. I'm trying to think of. Uh, uh, I'm sure we have, <laughs> um, Satachi Ventara. Uh, yeah. But, um, you know, our website does have a lot of use cases. That's what I was going to point to, Steve. And I don't know if that's linked to uh, this first link that's here, um, where we do have customer use cases and it's divided up by industry. And there might be some with uh, pharma uh, yeah. some use cases there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And like Rich is saying, we, we do business in thousands of different companies and they use our, our data management products for lots of purposes. You know, in pharmacy and pharmaceutical, you know, they're managing a lot of test data and a lot of customer data and a lot of um, operations data. And, and they're, they're big users of, of you know, ways to, to manage that data both in the cloud and on, on premise um, consistently. Um, you know, GDPR is important for them, uh, being able to uh, you know, optimize their data storage so that they're not you know, incurring lots of uh, egress costs from, from pulling data back from the cloud for different uses. We get involved in, in using our tools to be able to manage that more effectively. So it's uh, you know it's very flexible in how it can be how it can be used. So if you have a specific requirement, a lot of those pharmaceutical type of applications are very specific to the company, to the project, to the systems involved. Uh, it can really mold to to help to do what you need to do there, no problem. And we'd be glad to carry that conversation on if you got a specific project you're looking at. Okay, perfect. There is one more question about whether you cooperate with OT security firms. Um, so I don't know if you just answer that quickly before we wrap up. Do you have any kind of partnerships with those OT security firms, people like Forescout? Um, I think on an, for, um, no, um, I, I don't know if we have partnerships with them, but obviously security is paramount for, for all these implications, right? And so, uh, it, it, you know, we, we do our own uh, security testing for uh, the software that we put out there. And, um, it, it, you know, those always come up for the specific needs uh, for whatever the implementation might be we can address. Okay. I don't know, Steve, if you've got better answer than yeah, that. Yeah, no, but, all, all I know yeah. is what I've heard from talking with uh, you know, our project people is that we, we integrate very, uh, very, very often with, uh, of course, always <laughs> with those types of security mechanisms that are in place already. And our products don't, uh, you know, don't, um, don't remove uh, you know the ability to to use those those products as part of it, and and the interfaces are very flexible once again. So if we need to pass data with a security application, you know through an API through a database database interface, that's no problem. Yeah, you know, we can synchronize okay. things. Yeah. 
Perfect. All right. Thank you very much, guys. I think we need to wrap this up now. We're at the top of the hour. So thank you both for your amazing insights, knowledge, um, great demo. Thank you for, for making this event possible. Um, and uh, thanks also to everybody who, who tuned in and, and we hope you find it valuable. Apologies again about the, my technical hitch at the beginning and my croaky voice, uh, but we hope to see you very much uh, the manufacturing days, for example, uh, on May the 17th and 18th. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day.